So let's talk a little bit about preferred stock. And um, I'm going in no really good order here. I'm just going to take a, a few of these points. Because we're almost halfway done and I'm only on slide four. Um, <laughs> so first of all, again, backing up a little bit, preferred stock is going to be authorized in uh, Certificate of Incorporation in Delaware, Articles of Incorporation in California. And the usual way is to have all the rights and privileges of the preferred set, in, set forth in the Certificate of our, our Articles. Uh, point number one, just as a matter of process, the, the Board of Directors has to approve that. And to amend articles, uh, it requires consent of the shareholders in both California and Delaware. There is this concept called blank check preferred where the articles basically say the Board of Directors is authorized to create all the rights and preferences of various series of preferred. You will see that sometimes, and the, and the reason that's there is so you don't have to go back to the shareholders uh, every time you issue preferred, the Board is given the authority to do that. So, you know, but otherwise, otherwise, you have to go to the certificate to figure out what the preferred is. And this is going to be important to do because small differences in those terms can make pretty big results both economically and even as a tax figure. So starting with the conversion rate or price, the, the only thing I want to pause on is that preferred will, okay, so in my, in my world, convert, preferred always converts to common, right? It will convert on IPO, right before an IPO, qualified IPO, it has to be big enough, uh, or it will convert uh, at the election of a majority of the preferred or some other percentage or it will automatically convert sometimes on certain other events. But usually it's IPO and then the election of the holder. So you have to figure out at what price it converts. So typically, not always, typically we start out with each share preferred converting to one share common, just to keep the number simple. But we don't usually say it that way. We usually say it has a conversion price. And the conversion price is typically going to be the issue price of the preferred divided by conversion price. And what is conversion price? Conversion price out starts out as issue price. So if I sell you preferred stock for a dollar a share, uh, and then the next day we do an IPO, it's going to convert at the conversion price. The conversion price is going to be one dollar a share. So it all works out one to one. Why do we phrase it that way? Because the conversion price is going to be adjusted by different anti-dilution triggers. If I sell you preferred stock for a dollar a share, and a day later I do a big common stock split, so now I've got twice as many common shares. Well, that's not very fair, is it? You know, the conversion price will adjust by that. So the number of common shares when the preferred converts is going to increase proportionally. Okay? So, so that's why it, you, you'll see it phrased kind of funny that way. But that's the concept, is to take into account anti-dilution. <coughs> conversion triggers, uh, IPO, um, uh, or, or consent of a majority. And uh, anti-dilution, I've given you the basic one. It's when there are these additional stock dividends and stock splits. That, that's always an anti-dilution adjustment. You can see how unfair it would be if it weren't. I'm going to talk about other anti-dilution adjustments in a little later. So let's get down to this here so I don't have to turn my back on everybody. So participating versus non-participating. Um, and remember what I said about not talking about tax? Well, here's another tax point. Uh, a lot of times people will, will hang their head on this participation feature and saying this is not preferred stock for purposes of some of the punitive provisions of the tax code. For example, in 305, uh, there, there are, as you know, there are rules in 305 that, that imply a sort of OID concept and redeemable preferred, right? I'm going to talk more about that later. Uh, but more importantly, qualified non-qualified preferred stock. Uh, some people will try to say, well, it's participating, so it's not preferred. And that doesn't work, by the way. Uh, the fact that it is a participation does not mean it's not non-qualified preferred. Now I gotta step back and tell you, never non-qualified preferred. In other words, non-qualified preferred stock is not treated as preferred stock, it's treated as debt. So, if, if, um, um, so you may have taxable events when you didn't think so. For example, you might have, not have a 351 transaction when thought you did, because non-qualified preferred stock is treated as debt. Well, what's not qualified preferred, it's capped and limited as to growth, right? And it's redeemable, basically. And that's kind of a big picture 
but you'll want to look at those rules whenever you see uh, referred stock and you're being asked to look at the tax aspects, if it's redeemable. That's the thing to look for. And again, I'm going to talk more about that when we get into redemption. But one of the first things I do when I see articles or a certificate or, or a term sheet is I see if the stock's redeemable. If it's not redeemable, I don't even think about it. If it is redeemable, then we have to do the analysis. Uh, okay, so participation, just so we're all on the same page. What that means, non-participating preferred, means that the preferred stock, it gets a certain return, and that's it, right? So I buy it for a dollar a share, it means I'm going to get a dollar back, you know, on liquidation of the company, sale of the company. Or maybe I get two dollars back, or maybe I get some multiple. But whatever it is, that's it. I don't participate in growth any further than, you know, whatever my multiple is. And it's not really dependent. That's non-participating. Participating means that I get whatever I get and or I get a percentage as if I convert it to shares. That's participating. So remember what I was saying about conversion? You know, preferred stockholder would not likely convert participating preferred stock to common because they're already participating. They don't need to convert, right? If it's non-participating, then they would. Now. If we do have, there are more variations of participation and non-participation than we can talk about. It's always negotiated. And the market can be relatively efficient. It's saying what's standard these days. But I have seen more variations than you can imagine. Because it's not only the preferred and the common, it's preferred versus other series of preferred. Who gets paid first? Is it Perry Pursue? The A first, and then the B, or is it the B first, and then the A? Uh, and then, what's the what's the multiple? Does the preferred stock get one times our investment back, or do they get two or three or four? So what you'll typically see is if it's a multiple of their investment, like non-participating, if in other words I invest in the company and I say I want five times my money back before the comma gets anything, um, there'll be a cap on it, right? So it'll be. In other words, it'll be X times up to a cap, that's what I'm saying. If it's participating, it may be I get one time <coughs> my money back plus my percentage as if I convert it, you know, based on my percentage interest in the company. Or it might even be I get one times or my percentage as if I convert it. All I can tell you is that it's all over the map. It's whatever is negotiated. And it's the kind of thing that somebody has to look pretty carefully at. There are very sophisticated you know, software programs out there that, that model this. And the thing is, is that uh, it, it's one of those provisions every once in a while people kind of scan over and they don't think about it, it slips by. And I've seen a lot of companies where the founders are out there working for the, for the investors and they don't know it. And they're just never going to clear those preferences. So it's the kind of thing companies need to be careful about. Liquidation events. Um, Sale or merger of the company, uh, you know, liquidation, of course, uh, sale of all of the assets of the company. That's all pretty standard stuff. Sometimes we have a big negotiation over whether an exclusive license is a liquidation of that. And every once in a while, all of that stuff is not a liquidation of that. And sometimes it says a liquidation event is all of those things, unless the preferred stockholder decide that it's not. So the parties pretty much agree on what the liquidation event. I don't have it on the screen, but there's also a question as to value. And um, how do we value the consideration, right? So if I've got my preferred uh, stock and I'm entitled to you know, a dollar a share before the comma gets anything, and we do a, we do a type C reorg, say we do a stock for an assets for stock transaction, right? So the company sells all of its assets to a company and gets back stock. Now the stock gets distributed in liquidation, how do we value the stock? So there's often provisions in the agreements regarding how we value that. Typically the board of directors in good faith. Typically that's it. Just so you're, you're 